Alrighty. Good morning, everybody, or Thanks. good afternoon now. Uh, I'm Amber Mitchell, Public Engagement and Community Programs Coordinator here at the National World War II Museum. And I'd just like to thank all of you, again, for joining us for our uh, Lunchbox Lecture. Uh, for those of you who this is maybe your first Lunchbox Lecture or uh, you're joining us from on Facebook, uh, we do these uh, every first and third Wednesday of the month. So uh, please come out and join us again and again. Um, before we get started today, just a few housekeeping things. Uh, please silence your cell phones for those of you who are in the room just as a courtesy to our speaker. Um, and then a few upcoming events that we have going on for the month of March, uh, on March 15th, uh, so that is a week from tomorrow, next Thursday, uh, we have Victory is Served, which is a uh, cooking demonstration of World War II era Louisiana foods. That's going to be happening over at the Southern Food and Beverage Museum over on um, O.C. Haley Boulevard. Um, there are still spots available for that, but pre-registration is strongly encouraged, so please go to our website to register for that. Uh, on March 21st, which is a Wednesday, we have Women of Courage, a conversation with Ann Levy and Nicole Spangenberg, who were both uh, two survivors of the Holocaust as well as resistance fighters during the war. And that's also a completely free event happening here in the uh, Louisiana, excuse me, in the U U.S. Freedom Pavilion uh, on the 21st. We have a reception at 5 and the conversation starts at 6. Uh, lastly, uh, on March 28th, also a Wednesday, we have Meet the Author with Dan Holman, who has uh, just published a new book on the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, and that will also be happening over in the U.S. Freedom Pavilion on this campus, so please join us for that uh, on that day as well, March 28th. Uh, today's presentation is streaming live on Facebook today and will be available for viewing in its entirety on the museum's Facebook page at facebook.com slash WWII Museum. Uh, feel free to share that stream with any of your Facebook friends who may be interested and if you're watching the stream live today this afternoon, please uh, offer a question to our speaker and we'll get to that in the during the Q&A section at the end of the presentation. Uh, so now that's out the way, I'm sure you're tired of hearing my voice, so I'm going to turn it over to Patrick. Uh, and as a quick introduction, Patrick Stephen is the Gary Sinise Foundation-sponsored oral historian here at the, musician, at the museum, uh, a position that he's held since June of 2015 after deployment to Kuwait and Afghanistan with the U.S. Army. Uh, he served 16 years in the Army as a military intelligence slash historian officer and holds a master's degree in history from the University of New Orleans here in New Orleans. So please join me in welcoming Patrick Stephen. Thank you. So this is my first presentation ever. So <laughs> if I stutter, if I stop, if I just please just kind of keep pushing me and I'll keep going through. So this was uh, baseball during World War II. This was one of my favorite photos. This was uh, FDR forcing throughout the first pitch at the Senators game every year. This one particularly was, was special because everybody got out of the way when he was even back. <laughs> so my, my thesis actually uh, came from inspiration from the museum. I, when I interned here back in 2013, didn't have a really topic at the time. I was doing the Base Realignment and Closure Act of 91 and 93, which already sounds boring as it is. So I had uh, lunch with the research department and brought the topic of baseball. So I started digging more and more, and I found that there were some, indiscre uh, some discrepancies with the financial numbers of baseball from the owners. So dug a little bit more, found out there was a National League World War II owner meeting minutes in the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame out in Cooperstown. Emailed the archivist, she sent me 1,300 pages of all their owner meeting minutes. So here's the, the cool thing with this, is the owner meeting minutes, they, if they have financial numbers, they cannot be declassified for 50 years. So they weren't even available to the public until 95. They were digitized in 2011. So by the time I got to them, nobody had seen them. They were in the basement of the Hall of Fame. So she sent it to me, and I also found the 1951 Congressional Hearing Against Baseball. I put those two together, and then that's where my primary sourcing for my thesis came from. And so this will be the basis of my presentation today. So just to give you a little history about baseball, uh, this kind of leading up to World War II. 
So baseball was created in 1886. Of course, everything was free at the time. All the players played for, for free. Now, the players wanted to be paid to the actual play in baseball. The owner said, no way. All the profits that come from admissions comes to running this team, comes to running whatever stadium we're in. So the players revolted. And when they revolted, it was bad. It started in 1891. The revolt only lasted a year. They created this thing called the Players League. And so their voices were putting in the local newspaper and it was back and forth. Well, eventually the players lost. But the public perception was already damaged to baseball. So for the next 10 years, baseball attendance plummeted. When baseball attendance plummeted, a lot of these stadiums were abandoned. So originally started off as eight teams, they got down to four teams. So in that 10 year period, that's when some owners, I'm not owners, I'm sorry, some uh, big, big business magnets decided to go, you know what, we can create our own league. So they said they can occupy all of these old abandoned museum, uh, stadiums. So that's where the uh, American League came from. So they decided to fill it back in. And as they're doing this, the National League again is pushing back. It's like, there's no way you can do this. We have territorial rights. We own this. Went back and forth, back and forth. American League wins. So the American League was created in 1901. And when the American League is created, so now you have two, two leagues. Now, the baseball at the time was only in the northeast section of the United States. So that's where it stayed pretty much until after the war. So, in 1903, they had the Cincinnati Peace Pact. This was, in essence, in essence to keep baseball whole together with the two leagues. That stayed good all the way up until about World War I. Now, in the meantime, the Federal League comes in, which is known as the Western League. The Federal League comes in, and they want to occupy more cities. So as they're doing this, they want to occupy more cities. Baseball now, National League and American League, there's no way that's happening. So they decided to put them in federal court. Well, that didn't work, because baseball is protected by its, its See the best way I could put this. Um, the Sherman Act, the Antitrust Act, uh, the Sherman Law of 1890, and the Clayton Act of 1914, which states baseball cannot be sued as a trust because all of the revenue stays with, inside the state. It's not an interstate commerce. So with that being said is baseball cannot be sued, period, whatsoever. Well, the Federal League said, you know what? We want to sue baseball. They go to the federal court. Judge Landis comes in and doesn't, doesn't give a ruling for two years. And for those two years, the Federal League runs out of money. Says, you know what? We lose. That ends. They revive it again in 1922. And now in 1922, the Supreme Court says, you cannot sue baseball. They are not a trust. So now that goes away. That's the end. There's no more suing. That's why today you don't see any other leagues of baseball coming out because of this 1922 Supreme Court hearing. So... In between there, we hit World War I. Now, 1917, the, there was a three-party commission that actually was the commissioner of baseball. One of them, the AL president, Van Johnson, realizes that manpower was critical in World War I. So during this time, he decides to send out a letter to President uh, Wilson to say, listen, is it possible that we could get a, an exemption for 288 of my players, so that way they don't get drafted. And that went in the paper, and they were upset. People were upset. They said that baseball, is, they wanted money, it's all about the owners, who cares about us? The backlash was bad. So, the, at the time, they were gonna put out a work or fight order, but that never happened. But baseball already had a black eye. So this was going to the end of 1918. Now you're going into 1919. The White Sox, the Black Sox scandal at that time. Nine players decided to throw the World Series for money. This is a fact. This was the last straw for the three-person committee. They said, look, these, apparently they're not doing a good job. So they wanted to do one commissioner. And who was the one person who was in power that helped baseball get through its time? Judge Landis, the guy that gave no decision back in uh, 1914 against the Federal League. So, Judge Landis is now put into place. 
And so with Judge Landis coming in, baseball now has a nice golden age called leading up to about 1940. That's what I just talked about. Okay. Territory rights. This is not a map of the teams during World War II at all. This was a map a few years ago. So this is territorial rights. So, I'll give you an explanation so it's applicable to New Orleans. So we're looking at New Orleans right around here. At the time, it's the Texas Rangers. That's not true. They were part of the Miami Marlins minor league farm team. Now, if a major league team wants to start into wants to start a team into a city, it has to get permission from all of the owners. They own the right to that territory of New Orleans. So even if 18 teams say that's a good idea, can't have it. All the teams have to vote on it. So, in the case of my poor Oakland A's, right here, they cannot leave Oakland at all. They've been trying to go to San Jose, Fremont, they can't because the Giants own the territorial rights of that. You go back a little bit, that's how the American League came in. Because the National League says, we own the right to that area, you, can't, you cannot start a team there. So this is explanation of the territorial rights. Still applicable today. Well, all the way down from AAA to single A, they own the rights to that city and the surrounding area. So, this will come back later on. So now we're going to go into 1940, 1941. So, thanks to my buddy Dan Olmsted, I have some information about a, a poll that was taken. 1940, March of 1940, they took a poll that says, should baseball players be exempt from the war? 84% said no. Go back to World War I, remember what happened there. They tried to get exempt, it didn't work out. So in order to get ahead of this, December 7th happens. So all of the owners decided to get together and they asked, they begged, Judge Landis, you've got to write a letter. You've got to keep us going. They want to get ahead of this before they don't want to go back to what happened during World War I. Landis does not like FDR. They had a terrible relationship, those two. So that's why it took them so long to write this letter. You're looking at about January 14th. So almost about a month and some change after the attack, that's when he decides to write a letter. So he writes a letter, but he's not going to deliver. So he gives it to Clark Griffin, who is the senator's owner. Clark Griffin has a relationship with FDR because he goes every year to present two tickets to the first game of the senator's baseball game. And so he has this cordial relationship with him. So they get the letter to him. So he goes over there and he's the one that convinces FDR, you might want to take a look at this. So FDR writes, of course, the green light letter. Three days later, on January 17th, it says, I want baseball to continue. Now, he never said anything in terms of specific or manpower or money. Just keep it going. You can do what you got to do. You're not exempt, but you're not shut down. So it's a gray area. And this is where the owners operated in this little gray area. All right, so one of the stipulations that FDR had in there is more night games. Owners hated night games. They said it takes away from the, uh, from the profits, because night games happen six, seven o'clock, you're after dinner time, nobody's gonna spend money, plus I don't wanna pay for electricity when it comes to lighting up my stadium. So if, uh, FDR said you have to have night games. We have a lot of people in the factories, you've gotta keep it going. So with that being said, So, more night games for the factory workers. All the concessions, when you break this down, all the concessions in all the Major League Baseball team, they didn't run it themselves. They had third parties run it. So when it comes to finding the figures in this, it was very difficult because every stadium had their own individual uh, concessionaire to do this. So this was what was given up to all the owners in order to keep it going. So I'm gonna break each one of these down, let me make sure what the next slide is. Okay, that's what I wanted to show. So look, these are when 
Look at the, the times when they had nights. Look who didn't have it. We didn't have lights. Chicago Cubs. We all knew that because they didn't get lights until what, 1997? <laughs> Why did they have lights? Dug a little deeper. So the way Wrigley Field was situated, putting in lights would harm all the businesses all around it and people couldn't sleep around there. So they had a city ordinance that says no lights past a certain time. So because the city was hampering this, they didn't put any lights. So finally in 1996, they lift, I'm sorry, 1986, they lift the ordinance. 1987, they install lights. So that's the reason why. It was, it was actually Chicago and then eventually Boston did it after the war. I'll talk more about lights in a little bit, about how they affected the income and what, what stadiums had them and why they used them, their effect and whatnot. So we'll go back a little bit. So, more night games. So this is the first thing that the owners did not like at all. They had to have seven games, seven night games no matter what. Now there were certain stadiums that could not have night games. For example, you got Ebbets Field, and you also have, who was the other one? Oh, Polo Grounds, couldn't have night games. Why is that? Second Corps comes in, says, listen, I need you to turn these lights on, and then I'm gonna see the silhouettes of these ships. So they turn the lights on, they're standing out in the boat, read this in the sporting news, they're standing out, they look out, and they can see all the silhouettes of all the ships for miles. It says, you're not having night games at all. How are we gonna do it now? So now they had to split night games with other teams. So with the night games, in the beginning, the owners didn't like it because of the revenues that they thought they were going to lose. In actuality, people would spend more money at night games because they had nowhere else to spend it. They had nowhere else to eat. They had nowhere else to go. They had nowhere else to, to go have fun. So as time goes on, increased revenue of, from the night games. After the war, night games exploded. Until then, they argued against it. Now, when you, also, when you look at third-party concessions in terms of food and whatever sell, the ration did affect baseball as well. They couldn't really sell as much. Uh, it was very basic too. I mean, you're looking at hot dogs, uh, popcorn, hamburgers, a lot of sugary drinks, a lot of candy, but nothing, nothing that you see today. Today you can get a whole gourmet meal at a major league baseball, and of course it would cost you a gourmet arm. <laughs> Going to a Saints game now, you're spending 60 bucks just so you can eat. It's the same thing. Well, back then it was very simple. So as far as concessions, they um, they kept it simple. I couldn't find too much of those numbers out there at all. That's why I was I, I wouldn't say I glossed over it too much, but I couldn't get that much information, so I couldn't really argue a point of that. So we're gonna in, now moving on to bond drives. So the bond drives. So what they wanted to do is. They wanted to create more attendance to come in, but they wanted to sell bonds. How do you sell bonds and at the same time keep the attendance flowing in with minimal cost to you? You substitute bonds for admission. Buy a bond, get in free. But you also have your own little section, your own little bond section. Not exactly the best section, but it's not the worst section. But let alone, it is a section. So that way you're guaranteed a seat every single time. So that way it's a steady stream of bonds coming in. So that's how they would, when they would did the bond drives. Each owner would give up 10% of their salary, as well as the players would give up 10% of their salaries. And so that was a way of showing their patriotic way. That will come back later on whenever they put in the financial numbers. Now, the big one, manpower. I could talk on hours on manpower, but I'm gonna consolidate this. So for manpower, on average, 500 major leaguers, you're looking at about 4,000 minor leaguers all get drafted in this, in this time period. We're looking at about 41, 42 going all the way to 45. In that time period, in that time frame, you need to fill in those slots with somebody else, four Fs, people who were past their prime, uh, some other minor leaguers that couldn't make it. They were trying to fill those slots in. So as they're doing it, they have this thing, Major League Baseball does, it's called the Reserve Clause. Now it's gone now, but back then, the reserve clause says, if we, uh, if we have this one player, we own this player, no matter what. Now we can choose what we do. We can trade him, we can get rid of him, we can sign him, but he can't look for somewhere else. There's no free agency at all. So when a player was drafted, <coughs> oh man, what happens if all these 
well, these guys go overseas. What are we going to do? What are we... When they come back, we're going to have to renegotiate their contract. Again, their skills have diminished. So in order to, get, to mitigate that, baseball got ahead of this. According to the owners' meeting minutes, so the, the owners decided to use, I said, listen, let's put baseball training camps in, all the, in as many home front bases as we can. But let's not pay for it. How are you going to pay for it? Well, what's the one game where revenues don't go to the home team and don't go to the away team? The All-Star game. So all the proceeds from the All-Star game will go to sending all the equipment overseas and on the home front in terms of building baseball fields, providing baseballs, providing bats. Well, who's going to build it? Well, services can build it, we'll provide the guidance. So who do they send at minimal cost to provide the guidance that knows the field the best? Groundskeepers. Send all the groundskeepers out, they all went out there and they created the fields ahead of before all the players were drafted. So that way when Joe DiMaggio finally shows up to his enlistment and in boot camp he can have his own charity game afterwards. And with every other person that way their skills are not as diminished. Now the minor leagues is a little bit different. They took everything from the minor leagues. <coughs> minor leagues, at one point in time, was down to nine teams. So they factored that, that, those losses into their bottom line. So you're gonna go from 32 teams to nine. They lost revenue. It's not really revenue that they've lost, it's potential revenue. So I didn't add it into the PowerPoint, but I'm gonna slide a little bit into here. So in terms of the teams lost, I don't know if I have it. Sorry about this. We'll go back. So it went from 32 teams in 41 to 9 teams in 43 to 10 teams in 45, and then 46 went back up to 12. So in that time frame, the minor leagues had nobody. That was a source of revenue for the owners. Slide that into the bottom line. So whenever they're pre pre presenting themselves in front of Congress, well, we've lost a couple hundred thousand. Congress didn't ask where that money came from. Okay, you lost money, so we'll keep you going. You're okay to keep going. You're not really making any money. They would slide those projected losses in there. So the minor leagues was one of them. Now, whenever a player comes back, whatever negotiated salary that they have, they don't get a chance to, they have to negotiate the following year how much they're going to make. If they don't negotiate the following year, let's say, for example, they make $50,000. By the time the next season comes, if they don't negotiate a new contract, they only make no less than 75% of what the previous year's contract was. They have absolutely no say at all. So the owners, you would see a dip. Whenever you're looking at the numbers, you would see this dip of salary. 42, 43, 44. I mean, they were down to, I think it was 1.6, 1.7 million for the whole league. Today, that's the, that's the major league minimum. The well, major league minimum is actually 175,000, but sorry. So when you add that in, in 1946, it exploded to 3 million and then 6 million. And so what it was is they were actually using this reserve clause to hold players back whenever they were, because everybody would come back at a different time. Some come back in 43, some came back in 44 and 45. When they came back, they decided not to negotiate their salary. And they said, well, we can't because you haven't been playing for a couple of years, so we're just going to keep you the previous salary. So 1940 salary, 75% of that salary in 1944. Save money in that way. But then they put the 1944 salary into their numbers. So technically, they're gonna, they should be paying like this, but with the reserve clause, they didn't. But they still put that in there. So you add that to the bottom line. And then finally, one of our players came back, they had to give them, according to the National Selective Service Board for Major League Players, they had a 30 and 15 rule. Once they come back, they have to keep them for 30 days, if it was in the training season, or 15 days during the season. After that, they could let them go. And so when they come back, if they don't prove their worth, they were cut. But they can't be picked up from anybody else because they still own their right. It would be up to that team to determine where they go. So that would lead, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. We're going to go to 19, 
1970, I believe, 1970, 19, 1972. Flood, Curtis Flood versus Bowie Coon. This is where free agency comes in. Curtis Flood was a player for, I believe, the Phillies. Decided he was getting traded. He didn't want to be traded. He already had his home there. He's got his family there. He goes, I don't want to be traded. Can't, sorry, that's not your choice. It's a reserve clause. I'm suing Major League Baseball. Let's go back to 22. Can't sue Major League Baseball. They're not a trust. Yes, I can. And he kept suing, and he kept going, and he kept going, until eventually the Supreme Court says, you can't trade him. We can't tell you what to do, but we're not going to rule in your favor or his favor. So it was almost like a no decision. Free agency was born. Here we are 30 years later. That's how long it took. So you now you go back to the war. That's how they save money with that reserve clause. And they held it on to you. And lastly, <coughs> I didn't put this in there. I don't know why I didn't. World Series and relief games. So, again, they want to project that they're giving out money. They want to project that they're doing great for baseball. So how do you do that? We're going to give you profits. We're going to give, I'm saying you, I'm saying as in the USO. We're going to give them the Red Cross. We're going to give you profits from games three and four of the World Series. We're not going to, we're not going to give it in the beginning. We're not going to give it at the end. We're going to go right in the middle. So we're going to give you those profits. Again, World Series, biggest event. Well, it benefits those teams, but that way they do it right in the middle, games three and four, when it switched from home team to away team. So each person, each team took that blow. And then they had relief games. That was chosen by the commissioner, seven games. At his discretion, which of those seven games, all the profits are going to go to the, uh, to the USO and Red Cross. Owners didn't like it. Can't say anything against it. They didn't like it. So what do the owners do? They pick the worst possible games that they can put the money in. That's why the profits. What worst games? No games on Sunday because that was the ones that created a lot of money, and no night games. Right in the middle of the week on a Tuesday or a Thursday, right in the middle of the day. That's where your profits come from. So they would find some way in there to make it look like it was their benefit. So, go down to the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, which at the time, when it was created, it was actually called the All-American Girls Softball League. And then it was changed to All-American Girls Ball League, and then All-American Girls Baseball League. They didn't get the entire moniker All-American Girls Professional Baseball League until 1988 by the Baseball Hall of Fame that says, we're just gonna give you this title. So, with these name changes, this was only created, now this one actually was interesting to me because I thought the All-American Girls Baseball League was all around the country. Nope, it was all within 100 miles of Chicago. One owner, Phil Wrigley. So Phil Wrigley had, he had his own revenue. Had Wrigley, Wrigley Gum, he had a government contract. Baseball team, I'm not gonna say it was his toy, but it wasn't exactly his main source of income. So he decided to try something new, something innovative. So he brought in the All-American Girls Softball League. And of course, I'm not gonna get into it too much, but the specifics and the time. And so whenever that was created, that was his idea, his idea only. He tried to ask the other owners, hey, you guys want in on this? I got plenty of space, I got plenty of time, I've got the whole thing all set up. No, we're barely holding on as it is right now. We don't need another, a second league or a third league with girls. So when he brings that in, it starts to generate a little revenue. Completely separate from his baseball revenue. This was not Major League Baseball, so that was his own. It started in 1943, reached his peak at about 45, 46. 1945, finally, I'm sorry, 1954, finally gets disbanded. He couldn't find the talent anymore. Uh, eventually, around 1950, they started selling off the teams and individual owners. They all had their own agendas, their own ideas of food, their own ideas of tickets. And so with the league kind of decentralized, it started to dissolve. So it did last in the beginning, right in the middle of the war, 43, and it did last at the end of the war, but it was more of a novelty near the end and going into the early 50s. So you, of course, everybody knows the popular movie, uh, A League of Their Own. But that's more of a, they've taken pieces of history. They take the moniker that was given in 88 and add it to the 43 season. The 43 season didn't have eight teams, it only had four teams. So it was, it was 
different pieces. It's still historically accurate, but it was it just different parts of history on that on the league. So that was in its own little side. The Negro League was a completely separate league. The Negro League actually, whenever they were bringing in players from the early 30s, they were asked, what about the Negro League? Judge Landis says, they have a league of their own, let them play. So they wanted to separate them. They never wanted to include them. The Negro League wanted to play. They wanted to play in the stadiums whenever the teams were on away games. Can't do it, sorry. Territorial clause, we own this, can't have it. So they wanted to incorporate, there were some owners, Branch Rickey, really, really wanted to incorporate them, but as long as Judge Landis was in power, it was never going to happen, ever. And so it was always a separate league. Now again, their manpower was the same, uh, the same problem as Major League Baseball. They were losing manpower to the draft, they were losing manpower to defense jobs. Who's going to run it? So the Negro League was it's almost like the minor leagues. They're barely holding on. It's still viable, but you're looking at about eight or nine teams that kept going all the way through. Now, it wasn't until April of 45. So Judge Landis dies in August of 44. I mean, he had an iron fist on baseball. Everything went through him. Major League, minor league details, everything went to him, no matter what. When he dies, the owner's like, wow. Let's, 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 let's take a little time before we bring in another commissioner. Let's, let's enjoy this for a little bit. They didn't hire another commissioner for another six months. And they had free reign. They don't have anybody overseeing them the whole time. So they bring in this senator, Kentucky senator, Albert Happy Benjamin. No, Albert Happy Chandler. Albert Benjamin Happy Chandler. This guy was all smiles. All the time. Happy as can be. <laughs> Not really a big authority figure, but it was voted on by the owners to bring him in because he's he's going to help us. April 45, the interview happened. NCAA, NCAA. Somebody help me with this one. NCAA. NCAA. I went backwards on it. I knew what you meant. Yeah. <laughs> they come up and they ask him on April 20th, 45. Hey, what do you think about Negroes playing in? Major League Baseball. His exact quote were, if, Negro boy, if a Negro boy can die in Okinawa and Iwo Jima, he can play baseball for us. Again, two years went by until the first African American player was actually put into baseball, which was Jackie Robinson. But the war broke that down. It broke down that wall. It broke down that, that whole theory of let them have their own league. So, a separate league wanted to get in, but they couldn't. Again, with the night games, I just, I, I don't know why I find this fascinating. This took me forever to find. But, started uh, the night games, you're looking at, I think it was Cincinnati, it was the first one. Yeah, 1935. They started off, they had four night games. And as time went on, it was the construction, the installation of, nobody wanted to incur this cost. So you notice, a lot of these happened Previously, I mean, before the war even started. I just talked about this, all three. Joe DiMaggio, Peary Reese. Most, most Major League Baseball players never left the home front. If they did, they went to the very the outer, uh, outer rim of the United States. They never really deployed in a forward area where they were ever in danger. And they wanted to make sure because they don't want to have a celebrity on the local news, news reels or newspaper. So they kept them near the home fronts, and they were the ones that did all the, the baseball games, so the celebrity, uh, celebrity baseball games. They did all of the non-for-profit charitable events for all these games, Army Navy games. They were the ones that were the, the face of this. Now, pardon this terrible circle. I couldn't find a circle, so I had to draw it by hand. <laughs> It is awful. I tried it three times. The first two were just atrocious. So I finally went on the third one, so I told you I had to apologize for it. It's awful. I know. It's like, look what I can do with my left hand. So we're going to go to the Volata Ball and the Wooden Bat. Of course, you know about rationing during the war. Everybody knows there were certain goods. I'm going to give you the bad, the Volata Ball, and I'm going to give you the good, the bad. So the Volata Ball. Spalding 
I signed a contract with Major League Baseball in 1921 for 25 years. You're locked in. We're the only ones going to give you baseballs. That's it. Nobody else. All right. We'll play that way. War comes along. Japanese, oop, Japanese cut off. Rubber supply. Got a problem. Baseball's got 100% rubber core. What are we going to do? Well, let's ration the balls. So in 1942, they have baskets put in the foul area of most major league teams, most major league games. So when a ball was a foul ball was hit, it was unpatriotic to keep the ball. So you would throw it back down, put it in the basket. And those were called the 42 balls. And they would take those balls and they would hide them because they knew they couldn't keep them anymore. So now you enter 43. Running out of rubber. Got to come up with a solution. The Balata ball. <laughs> Terrible. Balata was actually it was a mix of synthetic cork and uh, a balata, it's like a balata tree. It was this terrible substitute. It was almost as hard as cement, but it had very little bounce. So Spalding, instead of testing it, they just put it out there. And it was terrible. So in 43, stats were, games were ending one nothing, 15, 16 innings, ball was barely going out of the infield. It was terrible. So the only way to compare it was in 1931, the owners had this thing, it was called the dead ball era. They actually put in a dead ball on purpose. Why would they do that? To keep the stats down, so that way the players wouldn't get paid as much. <laughs> 19, I think it, why would the owners do that? Why? Yeah. Well, that was coming back in now. They're like, oh, we gotta, we got to solve this really quick. So they go back to Spalding and says, listen, you need to figure this out, or we're going to find a competitor. Okay, buddy. You guys locked in. We're it. We need to figure it out. Very next year, 1944, government finally authorizes synthetic rubber. So what the Spalding was doing is Balata was, if you know what you know where Balata is, it's on the it's the hides of golf balls. It's telephone insulation cables. That's the material they were putting inside of a baseball. You ever try hitting one of those? A ba golf ball different, because it's inside core, but that's what they were they were actually taking the hides off baseballs. Reconstru reconstituting them and putting them in baseballs, the golf balls and baseballs. So, 1944 put out synthetic rubber, stats almost back to normal, not that great. Damage was done. Major League Baseball was upset. So, fast forward a little bit, 46, contract's over. What are you going to do? Spalding's like, hey, hey, can we uh, just, get, just want to sign right here really quick? Nope, we're not going to sign anymore. From now on, we're going to elicit all competition, and we need to know the specifics of your baseball. Because they were still in the contract, they were obliged. So they sent a representative, the Major League Baseball sent a representative to Spalding and got all the specifics on the baseball. It's almost like the Colonel's secret recipe in KFC. Once you get it, you just throw it out to everybody. Who's going to make it cheap? And that's what they did. That's why you see now 50 different types of baseballs. Because of this. Because of the rationing force that one company to to react, not pro-react, not get ahead of it. They reacted afterwards. So that is the Balata Ball. Only had it for about a year, year and a half. Now, let's talk about a good company, Louisville Slugger. <laughs> Louisville Slugger knew what was coming. They knew way in advance. So all of the bats are wooden, are specifically built for Pacific Northwest ash, right here. It takes longer for the trees to grow, but the wood's really strong. So, they knew something. Would, they started to see the shift. Anybody knows about the war, you know about the gun belt, and how you see the population shifting from inside to outside, inside to outside, and all the coast. So, when they did that, all the jobs in this area, the Seattle, Oregon area, they're going to defense jobs. Who's going to run this baseball plant? Oh, Louisville got ahead of it. We need to come up with a different alternative to Pacific Northwest ash because the demand for pulp and rationing was at its height. So they found the southern ash. Much lighter, faster growing trees, but the bats would break easier. How do you compensate for that? You have twice as much substitutes waiting for them. So that because every team, every player had their own specific bat. 
They would actually go down to the factory, goes, yeah, I like this one, this is perfect for me, and they had their own number stamped on it, and they had their own name on it. Go to Louisville today, you can literally you can buy a specific bat of that specify the specifications of that player. I want Joe DiMaggio's bat, here's his specs. You can buy it, just exactly the way he did. So, with that being said, is they saw what was coming. So when they did the Pacific, the Southern Ash, they made the switch. They also created rifle stocks for the M1, also for the Thompson submachine gun. Major League Baseball never asked them ever to switch. They just did it, and they never told them, and they never knew. And it wasn't until after the war that they finally got from the Army and Navy to get the highest civilian medal, which was the F medal, for creating this. So that's why you see now all of the bats clearly are wooden. They can't put a metal bat in Major League Baseball. The ball would fly everywhere. So with this, you never knew the difference. Of course, now with the different varieties of bats, bats have changed as time goes on. But the war forces them to go from right, the little honey hole right here down to here. And when they did that, they realized that they have a whole, a, all kinds of other trees to use because they never had left that one same recipe before. So the war changed the way the bat was uh, created. So that is a ballada ball and the wooden bat. Uh, people always ask me, what about everything else? What about the gloves? What about the uniforms? Well, those were all understood. I mean, you had your cotton rationing, you had your leather rationing, but it never really affected baseball because you don't go through those items as much. Bats will break, balls will go out in foul area, home runs. You're not going to throw a uniform over the fence. So it's a little bit different. So I didn't really put too much into that. Ah, transportation and concessions. So transportation. So I'm going to go back just a little bit. I'm only going to use the map, so bear with me. All the teams, make sure I'm going all the teams are located right here in this area, all except for St. Louis down here. So all right here. So what does that tell you? Spring of course, today spring training is held in Florida and Arizona. Cactus League, Grapefruit League. Why? It's warmer. It's nice. Spring training starts in March. What's not nice in March? Anywhere in here. <laughs> so, cost. So you go look at training camps. You're not going to transport the Red Sox all the way down to Florida to go to training camp. Too much. We're not paying that. Plus, we don't have room on the trains for your major league players. So the training camps are all located within five miles of the stadium. Have you ever done training camp in Massachusetts in the middle of March? Oh, the players hated it. Hated it. You know who loved it? All the all the fans. Because now they can watch free training camps because it was free. They could just stand outside and watch them. They weren't, they weren't in the stadiums though. They were in kind of like winky dink made up ones. But because of the rationing, they did not have priority on, the, on travel, plus in terms of cost as well. So all the training camps stayed right here. So baseball was literally regulated to this corner of the United States. This will come back to bite them in the future, and I'll explain it later on. But the location of the training camps, because of the rationing of fuel, because of the rationing of uh, manpower, because of the rationing of the, the priority in terms of the railway concessions, they couldn't move. So they had to do training camp where they played. Now, let's go a little bit to, I don't know if I'm ready to give you the third party concession yet. All right, I'm going to come back to that. Concessions. Look how much, I'm going to give you the numbers right here. This is how much of a percentage of the total figure of the, of the income for Major League Baseball. At its highest, 10% in 1943. 10% of the revenue. Most of the revenue comes from the admissions. That's where it comes from. So the best way to put it is, uh, National League President Ford Frick stated in 1943, how do you describe what the admissions are like? Well, imagine a 50 cent theory. You play for 50 cents, the home team gets 25 cents, the away team gets 25 cents, but two and a half, percent, two and a half cents out of each of those 25% comes to the league. Everything else goes to the home team. Radio, concessions,
promotions, whatever it is. So when you're looking at this number of 10%, 1943, only 10% goes to the home team. The away team got nothing at all. So it would be, there's no benefit at all to them whatsoever. Concessions didn't play a huge part, but it, it, it would sway you being 10,000 in the green to 87,000 in the red. And that's what they used. They used concessions as a way to drop that number even more. So now you've got your manpower losses with your salaries, then you got your minor leagues. Let's, let's throw in a little concessions in there too. I mean, it's dropping dramatically. Still showing a profit, but we're going to put in all these projected numbers. Because in concessions, you couldn't sell meat because it was rationed at the time. Or if you could, it was on very limited portions. You couldn't sell sugar. And back then, it was Coca Cola, it was ice cream, it was candy. Did, they didn't have any. Uh, Major League Baseball did not have a, an exemption to have more of these goods. So they put this in. So they go, listen, out of the 10% of our profits, we could have made 15%. So let's take that 5%, throw it in the bottom line. And they did. Well, I'm going to come back to that one. I'm really looking forward to this one. Interesting knowledge. These are all useless knowledge. All right. You know, the good thing about having notes is you actually have to read them once in a while. I think I hit all of them. Okay, so we're going to go, if you don't mind, I'm just going to go back a little bit. So I told you, March of 41, do you think Major League Baseball players should be exempt? 84%. No. March of 43, do you think baseball should continue during the war? Should it be stopped? 59% said continue. 28% said stop it. Still got some support. You're talking about 43 now. What started in 43? All American Girls Baseball League. Manpower was at its lowest in terms of the major leagues. Minor leagues had nine teams. So just keep that in mind. January 45. The war's got eight months left. Should baseball continue during the war or should it be stopped? 46% said it should be continued. From 59 to 46, the shift is going down. Baseball's getting a little worried. St. Paul, do you think professional baseball should continue during or be continued or discontinued during the war? 49% say continued. So as you can see, the trend is starting to go down. So baseball's popularity is starting to kind of shift a little bit less. Think about it. Factory worker has nowhere to go. He's going to go to the baseball the games. He's going to go enjoy. Mind you, baseball at the time was pretty much the dominant league in terms of sports at this time. NFL was in its infancy at best. The only thing you had, the only competition was college. College football and college basketball. And even then, half of college was uh, it's going to be graduates coming from the Army. So it wasn't, it was a little bit different. So with no competition, they kind of knew they had the monopoly on this, but you can't call them a monopoly because they really aren't, according to the 1922 Supreme Court hearing. So, I want to wrap it up just a little bit before I give you the interesting knowledge because I think it's kind of cool. I just want to double check my notes to make sure that I talked about everything before I wrap it up. Back to the interesting knowledge, but I mean, this is, I think is a cool photo, by the way. This was an um, engineer unit having demolitions in the background as we're playing baseball up here. Again, notice <laughs> who, how did you get this, the specs for this? Groundskeepers. Where did the equipment come from? Donations from Major League Baseball paid for by the All Star game, paid for by the USO from the World Series. So, Major League Baseball helps. Now, my conclusion when I come down to it is when you look at the financial numbers, I found this in the congressional hearing of 1951. So 1951, finally that shift, let me go back just a little bit, I'm sorry. The shift 
of all the people coming out, of all uh, manpower coming out to the outside coast. And again, Major League Baseball is right here in this corner. So with all these people moving out here, these cities, LA, San Fran, Seattle, Houston, hey, we want a Major League team. We want one right now. Owners are like, no, 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 we're, we're okay over here. No, we want a team. Our territorial rights, and you know, we, no, we want a team. They want to sue them. It's the golden rule, can't sue baseball. Can't. So eventually, the Congress has a hearing on baseball. First time ever. Again, 51, around that time, organized crime is becoming popularized <coughs> in America in terms of because they had the same kind of hearing style concurrent with baseball. So now America's finally seeing these uh, closed societies. Because baseball, up to this point, nobody knew anything. All they knew is they saw the games, they didn't know financial numbers. So all these cities says that we want a team. The conclusion of the hearing came out to where they didn't rule anything. They didn't say baseball is right, they didn't say baseball is wrong. They told baseball, you might want to think about expanding. You might want to clean it up. I can't tell you what to do because legally I can't, but you might want to think about expanding. Two years later, Boston Braves move to Milwaukee. Year after that, Giants and the Dodgers go here and here. And then the shift was on. And then they started moving. Because now you gotta think about it. They've been in stadiums for 30 years. Who's gonna build them a new stadium? Defense money down here. They'll do it. Okay, we'll switch. So the war pushed baseball from here to out here. And now training camps can go back down to the south. We'll come down here. We'll do it. That was the first shift. Second one was money, radio. It's the only way, because mind you, TV was just coming out. So TV profits were a whole other thing. But that's again, that's in the 50s, not during the war. During the war was radio. The owners were upset about radio, because radio was going to take away from people coming to watch the game. They think they can just sit at home and listen to the game and they won't come and spend any money, which was incorrect. Not everybody had a radio. Radio was free. So the owner, the major league, the owners said, you know what? Can't really charge people to listen, so we'll charge a radio station to broadcast our games, depending on the city. Each city has its, depending on the population, the higher the population, the higher the profits. Capping out at $100,000, $100,000. 40 and 41, it's a lot of money. But it never changed. <clears throat> 40 to 45, I'm sorry, 40 to 48, $100,000 all the way through. And it wasn't until afterwards that they realized how much money they could have had because they never capitalized it, so they added that to the bottom line. So now Major League Bright Baseball, for three, for three of the four years, 41 to 45 was in the red. The only time I ever showed a green was in 41. Of course, you gotta keep it going. So that's how the major league going, mind you, all this without congressional oversight. You can't, you got an exemption. You can't sue them. So baseball knew this, and the owners knew this. And so what they did is they used some of the financial numbers to keep baseball going. Not a bad thing, not exactly a good thing. Did it help? I don't know. So the conclusion of when I came down to my thesis was you can't lie with numbers. And from when I found the numbers, they actually put them in there. Projected numbers. What happens if we could have made money from the minor leagues? We could have made money if we had a full menu. What happens if we could have made money if we decided to increase more on our radio? So in the end, baseball continued on. 45, I'm sorry, 46, baseball exploded. I mean, now everybody wants to go to the game because it, it was there for the war the whole time. It was. But now you know what the owners did to keep it going. Use your own money to pay for the fields where the players will play on so that way it makes us look good. So let's go back to interesting knowledge. All right, three things. First, hot dogs. <coughs> this is, I found this interesting. 1942, 
Harry Stevens is a con concessionaire for the Chicago Cubs. So, uh, of course, Chicago, at the time, it was a cold game, it was a night game. I don't remember what, specifically which one it was, but sales were terrible in terms of concession. So he sends all of his, uh, all of his workers, go out into all the shops and buy as much dots and sausage as you can. Send half this way, goes the other two, go get all as much hoagie rolls as you can. So he goes out and they bring it all back there and he cuts the hoagie roll in half and puts the dots and sausage in the middle and puts mustard on it. He goes, go sell this for 10 cents. And they go out and they sell and they're running and they go, get your hot, your fresh hot dots and dogs, get your fresh hot dots and dogs. They're handing them out and they sell them all out. So, cartoonist, the local paper was there. Tad, I always remember this. Tad Dorgan, he was there. And he thought it was awesome. They were delicious. Next day, he draws up a cartoon of a dog, an actual dog inside of a bun. But he doesn't know how to spell Dotson. So he writes down, get your red hot hot dogs. And that's where the name came from. Because somebody couldn't spell the word Dotson. <laughs> yeah, I found that awesome. <laughs> that was from the Sporting News of 42. I found that one. So, now, the National Anthem, as we know it today, is played before every game, no matter what sporting event. Little League all the way up to Major League. But it wasn't the National Anthem again until 34. But then, you're going to go back. 1918. Brown October. World Series. Game 1. Chicago Cubs, which is ironically the last time they won before, you know, we all watched that. It was awesome. So, 1918, Cubs against Red Sox, game one in Chicago. What's near Chicago? Great Lakes training facility. So, third baseman. This is not the actual photo. I'm sorry. I'm just pointing which is because it's a human being. I'm not, this is not the actual photo from there because there wasn't a photo at the time because nobody knew how significant it was going to be. Third baseman, let me get you his name. It always slips my mind. Jackie Thomas, U.S. Navy Reserve. Was on furlough for a couple weeks. Plays third base. Again, war is going on. It's October of 1918. War doesn't end until November of 1918. They just had a federal bombing, uh, a federal building bombing two days prior. So the news, the atmosphere was morbid. The news was all, it's all over the paper. People are like, oh, I don't want to go to the game. So they go to the game, the game is 1-0, Chicago's ahead, and they finally decide we need to pep these people up. Seventh inning, they play the Star Spangled Banner. So everybody just kind of stops and is looking around. He stops, takes off his hat, puts it over his heart, turns, and faces, faces the flag. Now, in the military, whenever the national anthem or any type of patriotic song that we can stop, if we can stop, we look for the closest flag. If we can't find the flag, we face the sound. He decided to turn, look right at third base, and face that flag. Because everybody knows, Wrigley Field, all the flags are above center field. So he stops, sand over his heart. Everybody in third base sees this. What is he doing? I'll do it too. It's third base sides us doing it. So now the whole area is starting to do it. At the end of the game, everybody's cheering and throwing their hats out, and it was awesome. And now the crowd's into it again. Game goes to Boston. Boston's not going to be outdone. They saw how good this was. So they played at the beginning of the game. So then Chicago was like, nah. Game three comes. They played at the beginning of the game, and then the seventh inning. And it's like this back and forth, back and forth. Chicago loses. The very next year, they do it at opening day, the All-Star Game, and the World Series. It is not until 34 becomes a national anthem, and then it has to do all the games. So, the national anthem played at baseball games started 1918, right before the World War I ended, from a Navy reservist stopping and putting his, hand over his, his hat over his heart and being respectful to the flag, and it became popular at that time to where it was done in the seventh inning because of competition, changed to the first, to before the game, and then every other subsequent game after that. So that's why I found interesting knowledge on that one. And then the final one, ah, my favorite one, Bull Durham Tobacco. Bull Durham Tobacco. So in the 1920s, subsidiary, the American Tobacco Company had a subsidiary called Bull Durham Tobacco. But they wanted to advertise in all the major minor league ballparks. Again, it's the 20s. 
got radio, barely. And where were they advertised? They used the fence on the back of every, every stadium. So keep continuity, but we're gonna advertise in the back fence. But inside the foul area was twice as expensive than the foul area. They said, listen, we wanna keep it cheap. So we want people to know where it's at at all times. So when they would walk in, they look right in left field, in the foul area, they see a gigantic bowl. It says, smoke bowl durham tobacco. If a player hit it, he gets 25 bucks. <laughs> Ironically, that's where the pitch is warmed up. That's where the term bullpen comes from. Useless knowledge. I'm telling you, I don't know why. I don't know why. So, a little adding to that, I kept that, because I found this in the Louisville records, the Louisville Slugger records. I read at the side, I called the archivist to double check. She goes, yeah, that's true. Ironically, six months later when I was deployed, I made friends with the archivist, and while we were deployed, I asked him, I was like, well, can we, I heard that you guys, that's where I got the, the measurements for all the bats, for all the players and stuff. I said, can, can we get some custom made bats? Yeah, sure. Well, you gotta pay for the bat. We'll ship them out to you. So he shipped 47 bats to us, with our company logo on it and our names on it, straight from Louisville Slugger. A month later, Louisville was bought out by Wilson. So we had the last Louisville bat that came from the original factory. All because I kept in contact with the person to help me find this. Wow. So, questions. I, I, I'm a motor mouse, so sometimes I forget what I'm talking about and I keep going. I know it's a lot. Question from Facebook. Okay. Um, was the war a big factor in the worldwide spread or popularity of baseball? It absolutely was. It actually, uh, and that's where, because we had the, op the occupation of Japan afterwards. Why do you think Japanese have such a huge influence on baseball? Uh, that was one, and of course in Germany as well. It didn't take too much off in Europe because it wasn't such a popular uh, sport over there, but with all the service members out and doing occupation duty, and then we started having bases in the 50s and 60s, yes, they did play a huge part because every base has an influence on the local population. And then, of course, with baseball being there, that's the only news that we have. So yes, it absolutely did. It's kind of like uh, how World War I affected our culinary uh, appetites because we brought everything back over from Europe and we decided to discover all these new cuisines. Thank you. Yes. Can you go back to the very first slide, the one where Roosevelt's... Roosevelt's is heaving, leaning yeah. backwards. Right. Everybody says, get out of the way for this guy. Yeah. Who are some of the gentlemen that are up there? I can only identify two. So here we are. We're looking at Clark Griffin, owner of the Senators. That was his boy. That was the one that showed up every single year. Here's two free tickets. I'll see you later. Right here, that's my guy, Connie Mack. This guy wore a suit. We talked about it earlier. He wore a suit to every game, no matter what temperature it was. Unfortunately, he owned, he was the owner, operator, and manager of the Philadelphia Athletics which ran out of money. It was the only club to ever go broke. So Major League Baseball, all the teams chipped in to help the team continue on throughout the war. Congress stepped in and goes, whoa, 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 whoa. That's interstate commerce, you can't do that. Goes, it's okay, we're not making a profit. We're just, look at the bottom line, it's zero. We're just keeping it going. Congress is like, okay, you got it. No oversight committee. So yes, that's the only, only two that I can identify on this one. Thank you. Any other questions at all? I try to make it as interesting as possible. I, I'm very giddy when it comes to this, and I can just sit here and talk for hours. But okay, well, that's it. Thank you for coming. Out.